During combat, red shirts handle bombs and other ordnance. White shirts mean safety officers, responsible for crew members' well-being and equipment safety. Among the most dangerous spots on the flight deck are the areas around the catapults. Nicknamed CATs, a Nimitz-class carrier's four catapults are on the bow and at the ship's waist or midsection. Each can rocket a plane from a standing start to 170 miles per hour in three seconds. Any mishap could wreak havoc, so CAT crews constantly test the system. This CAT pull here, we had in a down status last night for uh, maintenance, fixing to shoot no loads. No load is a catapult shot without an aircraft. We run the shots to make sure we have no steam leaks, uh, everything's good to go, because we don't want to take any chances with the pilot or the aircraft. The business end of the catapult is called a shuttle. We have two uh, steam pistons underneath this cat track. We have uh, 400, 450 PSI of steam that builds up downstairs. When you press the fire button, our launch valve is open, putting all the steam pressure behind the pistons, forcing the shuttle forward. But shuttles alone can't get jets aloft. Warplanes need more wind under their wings than catapults provide. An aircraft carrier launches planes by combining catapult power with lift created by turning into the wind. Nimitz-class carriers are fast enough to hurl jets airborne in a dead calm. These vessels use their speed to develop artificial headwinds of more than 20 knots. On George Washington's bridge, Captain Erdesey and team focus on keeping the ship's direction and speed steady. You see state-of-the-art digital displays, touch panel displays. You see displays that provide the conning officer, the person who's actually giving the orders on where to put the rudders and how to set the engines. In an instant, he can look and determine where his rudders are, how his engines are set, what course the ship is steering, how fast the ship is turning. To turn a carrier, it takes a huge mechanism managed by machinist mate, Senior Chief Paul Rodloff. Right now, we're in what's known as the steering ram room. What we have is what's called a double Rapson slide. We have two steering rams. We take hydraulic pressure. We'll put hydraulic pressure on the opposite ends of each ram. That'll cause linear movement of the rams. Attached to the rams is what's known as a cross member. We have a cross head block. If this ram moves in either direction, it'll cause this cross member to rotate. Attached to the cross member in the center is the rudder post, which extends out the bottom of the ship. So we take the linear motion of the rams, causes the cross member to move, that's transferred to the rotational motion, turning the rudder outside the ship. A Nimitz-class carrier's twin rudders are enormous, 30 feet high and 22 feet wide. Each weighs 50 tons. Crew members can use either to steer the ship, even if they lose their direct link with the bridge. Uh, the bridge loses control of the rudder, they sound an alarm. Right here, this is known as a trick wheel. What we do is we have a series of switches back here that will electrically disconnect the bridge from the steering system, will engage this steering wheel, and to drive the ship right from here. Deep in each carrier, from midship to stern, run massive shafts connecting her engine turbines to her propellers. To channel that power, the shafts pass through a series of reinforced chambers called alleys. On GW, Lieutenant Commander Tom Moninger oversees this alley. Where we are right now is in two Bravo shaft alley toward the, the stern of the ship. The purpose of this shaft alley is to hold the weight of the, uh, the shaft and allow us to turn the screw through the water. The nice thing about the aircraft carriers is redundancy built in. We've got four shafts and uh, can operate planes successfully on one of them if we need to. The carrier's enormous power helps aviators land. To touch down, pilots count on their carriers being in a particular spot at a particular speed. Otherwise, they'd never be able to drop a 25-ton airplane 
onto a flight deck at 200 miles an hour and stop in 300 feet. Pilots rely on teams of landing signal officers, or LSOs, to guide jets onto the deck. LSOs know exactly what it means to land at sea. They're aviators themselves. FA-18 pilot Lieutenant Commander Christine Acton directs the LSO platform at the stern. Glide slope is the downward angle a pilot must follow to land on a moving carrier deck. The LSO watching aircraft state and the deck status is the aircraft carrier, as well as what the energy state is in the airplane. The LSO can see that before the pilot's going to see that, before the airplane's going to react. If a pilot isn't on glide slope, or there's trouble on the flight deck, LSOs trigger wave-off lights that signal the aviator to abort the landing. LSOs do their part. But in the end, a pilot traveling nearly 200 miles per hour must have the skill and savvy to snag his plane's tail hook onto a steel cable only two inches thick. Right here is the number two wire. We have four arresting gear wires on board. And uh, actually, you're seeing there's two parts to each wire. We have a cross deck pendant and uh, what's called a purchase cable, which feeds down into the deck. There's an amazing amount of force being caught by these wires each time an aircraft lands. But there's more to the arresting gear than cables. They lead down to rooms like this, where bosun's mate Steve Tate operates one of four massive machines that have to stop a plane cold in three seconds. Basically, the aircraft lands, engages the cable, and pulls a, a thick set of pulleys in, and it pushes this ram into this cylinder right here, and it forces all the fluid out this cylinder and out this piping right here at, at 10,000 psi. It blows up through here, and this is the constant runout valve. This is the heart of the arresting gear engine. This, uh, this is essentially right here is what stops the aircraft. 308 gallons goes from here all the way up through here and around to this accumulator in three seconds. After a cable stretches for a catch, crew members guide it as it retracts into place. The crew needs only 45 seconds to prepare the arresting gear for the next in a line of incoming planes. Once airplanes land on a carrier flight deck, they come under the supervision of Flight Control Center, located just inside the tower. We can put about three F-14s here, two F-14s here, an F-18 here. It may look like child's play, but for Lieutenant Commander Michael Singleton, this exercise is deadly serious. He's the aircraft handling officer, or handler. It gets the most stressful when equipment goes down, uh, catapults or the arresting gear goes down. Uh, some aircraft has landed with an emergency or something like that, and those do happen quite often. Manipulating scale models, the handler recreates the flight deck on an outline crew members call the Ouija board. The handler has to think in three dimensions as he juggles the locations of jets, tractors, and crew members. On a flight deck, stand well clear, lower on aircraft, elevated three to the hangar bay. Stand well clear, lower all three, lower all three. Clear, abort, stand well, stand clear to battle, stand by to recover aircraft. With so much taking place in so many directions, crews work hard to be ready for anything. They constantly hone their emergency skills. On a boat deck, stand by for recovery and rest. Helmets on, chin straps down, stand by your line. Anybody stand by for The boat deck rescue crew drills often and hard. This is a carrier. We have a lot of people working in a flight deck. We got aircraft in the air. God forbid something happens. Either people get blown overboard or you have aircraft in the water. Uh, that what makes it our job here on the boat deck is very important. Because 
we're the ones who are gonna go and pick them up. 